think I mentioned to a few that our pastor, uh, Pastor Joe, is, is feeling, uh, not feeling well. Uh, he's undergoing some symptoms of the uh, bone marrow transplant that um, is not prohibit, not permitting him to come to church today and be with us. And uh, so he gave me a call this morning and asked me to fill in for him. So please keep Pastor Joe um, in your prayers. Uh, the exhortation this afternoon comes from the prophet Jeremiah, Jeremiah chapter 29, and I would like to read the first 14 verses of Jeremiah chapter 29, and we're going to focus just on um, one of the themes that one of those verses uh, brings out for us. Mm -hmm. Jeremiah 29, and I would like to read the first 14 verses. Now these are the words of the letter that Jeremiah the prophet sent from Jerusalem unto the residue of the elders which were carried away captives, and to the priests, and to the prophets, and to all the people whom Nebuchadnezzar had carried away captive from Jerusalem to Babylon. After that, Jeconiah the king, and the queen, and the eunuchs, the princes of Judah and Jerusalem, and the carpenters and the smiths, were departed from Jerusalem. By the hand of Elisah, the son of Shaphan, and Gemariah, the son of Hilkiah, whom Zedekiah, king of Judah, sent unto Babylon, to Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, saying, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, unto all that are carried away captives, whom I have caused to be carried away from Jerusalem unto Babylon. Build ye houses, and dwell in them, and plant gardens, and eat the fruit of them. Take ye wives, and beget sons and daughters, and take wives for your sons, and give your daughters to husbands, that they may bear sons and daughters, that you may be increased there and not diminish. And seek the peace of the city, whether I have caused you to be carried away captives, and pray unto the Lord for it. For in the peace thereof shall you have peace. For thus saith the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, Let not your prophets and your diviners that be in the midst of you deceive you, neither hearken to your dreams which ye cause to be dreamed. For they prophesy falsely unto you in my name. I have not sent them, saith the Lord. For thus saith the Lord, that after seventy years be accomplished at Babylon, I will visit you and perform my good word toward you in causing you to return to this place. For I know the thoughts that I think toward you, saith the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you an expected end. And then shall you call upon me, and you shall go and pray unto me, and I will hearken unto you. And you shall seek me and find me when you search for me with all your heart. And I will be found of you, saith the Lord, and I will turn away your captivity, and I will gather you from all the nations and from all the places whither I have driven you, saith the Lord, and I will bring you again into the place whence I caused you to be carried away captive. Note again, if you would, verse 11. For I know the thoughts that I think toward you, saith the Lord thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you an expected end. What does God think? That's kind of a, an, an absurd question, is it not? To ask, what does God think? Considering the immensity of who God is, his absolute righteousness and majesty, his perfectness, to understand that, that God has an eternal perspective on not just your life, but on the world and all of history. What does God think? Here, God tells us some of his thoughts. He speaks about the thoughts, plural, that he thinks ongoing, active, towards us. 
I think sometimes we need this, this great perspective of what God thinks, how God evaluates our situation as opposed to what my experience is compared to what I know for sure I believe is going to happen. Thinking God's thoughts after him as opposed to what does somebody else say about God. Third-hand information about God. Or even God's perspective instead of the party line or what this speaker says or what this particular theological standpoint or confession of faith is. God, as you know, wants us to have a first-hand walk with him in, in that compartment. Of course, we belong to a church and we, we have thoughts relative to this living organism. But there's this, this niche, this compartment where we are alone with God. And God wants us to know some of the thoughts he has towards us. I'd like to very briefly consider five things with you this afternoon. Number one, I'd like to look briefly at the context of Jeremiah, Jeremiah 29. Secondly, what is our tendency in similar situations? The situation where this letter from Jeremiah came to the people who had been carried away captive. We have a similar situation at times. What, what is our tendency? Thirdly, how does this apply to us today? In other words, does Jeremiah 29 verse 11 have application for the believer today? It does, but perhaps not in the way that we may think. Fourthly, what are some of the thoughts of God towards us? And then in the last place today, I'll close with a simple question. First of all, then, the context of Jeremiah 29 specifically verse 10 through 14, but just in a broader sense, Jeremiah had written two letters to the people of God. And these two letters were counteracting the false prophet's word. The false prophets, the diviners, had, did, had said there would be a very speedy restoration of God's people back to Jerusalem. And Jeremiah, in a couple of places, tells the people of God, it will be 70 years before you can come back into the land. So two letters to give them the truth of God. These letters were requiring the Jews to accommodate themselves to their condition and, and do not believe the false prophets, but listen to the word of God. Jeremiah's letters promises them a gracious restoration but only after 70 years. And he foretells the destruction of those who remained in Jerusalem. And he goes on to speak about the very bad end for these false prophets who he did not send. So in, in the larger context, Jeremiah is trying to comfort the people, even though the message is a little bit unsettling and the message is a little bit uncomfortable that they will be away from Jerusalem for 70 years. Actually, a little bit longer than 70 years, right? Because the, the carrying away took, took a couple of years to happen, and then it took a couple of extra years for them to get back. But, but 70 years away from their homeland. And now focusing down to verse 10. Verse 10, he speaks about the captivity. The captivity of Judah, those southern tribes. And again, in the larger context, he says it is going to be bad news. Uh, when we spoke about Haggai a few years ago, remember what God said? God said, if I were to tell you of what's going to happen, he said, you're not going to believe me, even though Jehovah God is telling you. And he says it will make your ears tingle. And the word was because of the people's disobedience, their idolatry, and many other bad things. God had to let the land enjoy its Sabbaths, as it were, and he was going to deliver the people into captivity 
and not bring them back for 70 years. It was, it was a horrible captivity, and it was God's will. Sometimes God's will for us is not the most enjoyable circumstance that we would wish it would be. But Jeremiah was dogmatic that it will happen. Isaiah 14 says, If the Lord of hosts purposes, who shall disannul it? Who's going to cancel it? Who's going to change it? The captivity would last for 70 years in the land of Babylon, which was the enemies of God's people. The 70 years away from the homeland meant that an entire generation would be born and die in captivity. The captivity was self-induced. It was brought on by their refusal to obey God, to follow God, to at least try to repent, try to understand what God wanted. But as well, the letter goes on to say, though they were chastised, they were never forsaken by God. They could be comparatively happy, if you will, in Babylon if they were obedient to God. Verse 5 and 6 that we read. God says you're going to have to inhabit the land. Pray for the peace of this place. Again, their misery was aggravated because they substituted their own will for the will of God. So verse 10, this captivity God goes on to say that he would perform his good word toward them. He says it here, he says it in Jeremiah 24, he says it elsewhere. He ties his word to himself. And there is this unbreakable union between the word of God and God himself. John 10, Jesus said the scriptures cannot be broken. Jesus said in another place, heaven and earth will pass away. My word will not. The book of Proverbs in chapter 19, verse 21 says, There are many devices in a man's heart. Nevertheless, the counsel of the Lord, that shall stand. There's many devices in the heart of man. Spin doctors, wrong interpretation, unbelief misguided end in views. There are many devices in a man's heart. But the word of God is eternal. The counsel of the Lord shall stand. And the Lord is reminding his people he is going to perform his word. It's a good word as far as God sees it. Though they're going to be delivered into captivity, that's only half of the word. They will be restored back after God has done his work. His word would be the template, it would be the pattern for everything that was going to happen. And God would conform the situation in Babylon exactly the way that he wanted it. The promise of God's word. The word was steadfast, it was unbreakable. And then he goes on in verse 10 to talk about the restoration. There would be a turnaround. There would be a blessed end. This whole matter of how the people got themselves into the mess. Uh, humanly speaking, we would think that God would say, stay in the mess. But God says, no, I am going to graciously restore this relationship. He says earlier, and he will say later, I am going to give the people a heart to know me, that I am the Lord, and they will be my people, and I will be their God and they shall return to me with their whole heart. What is happening here is their physical, their outward condition is mirroring the condition of their heart. Their heart was far from God. So God would remove them far away from his dwelling place, Jerusalem at that time. But the time was coming when God would bring them back to their homeland, mirroring bringing them back to his heart. They'll have a heart for my heart. Again, Jeremiah 24, verse 7, verse 12 and 13 that we read, this very bad condition of their heart. 
God would work it out and restore it. That's a quick summation of verse 10. Verse 11 revolves around his thoughts of them while they were under punishment, while they were being chastised. And his thoughts for them are of peace and not of evil. That's hard to see on the surface. God brings an enemy against his people. They're carried away captive from their homeland. They're going to be there for a generation. Our knee-jerk reaction is, that's evil. But God says, it ultimately, it's good. It's not evil. It's for peace. And he's going to give them this expected end, the very end to which he had promised, so they could have hope. He knows, he says, I know the thoughts I have towards you. God knows. We don't know. And we're so fallible and imperfect. And our mind is so checkered with all these different thoughts trying to, trying to crowd in. God knows. Known unto God are all of his works from the beginning of the world, Paul said in the book of Acts. His thoughts are expressed, this realization of them, he wants them to know that they might believe. Even if under punishment, he has these thoughts of peace towards them for their expected end. Think about that for a minute. If the people of God are being chastised and they're going into captivity and they're going to have a very bad time, and even in that situation, suffering because of their rebellion and disobedience to God. And even in that situation, God says, I have thoughts of peace to you, and I'm going to bring you an expected end. What are God's thoughts towards a people that are walking with him? Walking with him by the way, loving him, endeavoring to be obedient, enjoying his grace, his blessedness. So that's very quickly this immediate context. Jeremiah speaks about their captivity. He reminds them of the promises that God had previously given and God's word cannot be broken. And he talks about this restoration that will happen. And then in verse 11, all the while that this bad news is going to be carried out and happen, God has good thoughts towards these people. Now, if we were with those Israelites, the tribes of Judah there, carried away captive, and Jeremiah the prophet said, God really loves you, he wants your peace, he's for you, would we believe it? Though the outward circumstances are very negative. And that leads me to our second point this afternoon. What is our tendency in a similar situation when we suffer this a setback, an, an affliction, some cataclysmic trial, some difficulty. When we go through that, what's our tendency? And I think our tendency can go in one uh, or can go in two directions, one or the other. The initial direction that the uh, two tribes went and the reason they wanted to believe the false prophets were because people don't like bad news. I don't like bad news. They didn't want bad news, especially bad news from the hand of Jehovah God. They don't want to hear that he's going to chastise them. They don't want to hear that it's going to be 70 years. It's bad enough to go through a trial that lasts a few days or a week or a month, but 70 years? They, they did not want to believe that a loving God must bring us through trials and afflictions and tribulations to hone faith to wean from the world, to perfect what he started in them, like us. In Jeremiah's day, the people appear to have fallen into this camp, which is why they believed the false. They wanted to hear the good news. They did not want to receive the bad news. So I think God's people, even our tendency today, when, when there's some difficulty relative to our relationship with God, relative to 
to being in sin or going through affliction or trial. We can, we can not want to believe it or try to get through it really fast. In other words, not accept God's word. Or we can actually go the other way where we, we make it worse than God wants it to be. Imagine the worst. Limit the operation of grace. Even though there's these little arrows, these little um, silver linings where God says, okay, you're going to be in captivity, but build houses, uh, raise a family, pray for the peace of that place. These little mini comforts that God throws in there. But oftentimes we can think there's no chance of recovery. The situation is permanent. We imagine the worst. And this is what the patriarch Jacob did in a very difficult situation for Jacob. Remember, Jacob believed that his, the son that he loved the most, Joseph, Joseph is dead. And his other sons, if you recall, they had to go to Egypt to broker a deal for, for grain because there was a famine in the land. Uh, the patriarch Jacob is already on the edge because his family life had, had blown up and he had to move and, and there was difficulty with his several of his sons. And on one of the trips back from Egypt, they report to, to, to Jacob that this guy in Egypt, the Pharaoh, kept another son, Simeon, as collateral. And he told them, you are not going to see my face. In other words, you're not going to be able to buy grain until you bring your youngest, Benjamin. And remember when Jacob believed that he had lost Joseph, he took extra care of Benjamin because he didn't want Benjamin to suffer the same fate. I think Jacob knew what happened to Joseph, but it never was confronted. So now Jacob is in a very unstable place where he has to bring the entire family back to Egypt to survive. And he, he sees what his sons have done. They've messed everything up. And he says, me, you have bereaved of my children. Joseph is not, Simeon is not, and now you will take Benjamin away. All these things are against me. He goes on to say in verse 38 of chapter 42, you're going to kill me. All these things are against me. And I trust you know the story where Joseph is able to interpret that whole situation where he says, you meant it for evil, but God meant it for good. Jacob thought all these, it's, it's going to be the worst. There's no way God is in this situation. And yet he is reunited with his son under tremendous blessing for the rest of his life. Remember, God is operating from a vantage point of eternity. Mm -hmm. I wish I could see from eternity. I wish I could see every next step of my life in the life of my family. So why? So I could order it. So I could keep it all in. That's not what God wants. God wants himself mm -hmm. to order our steps and protect it and arrange the pieces so he can perform his good word even unto the end. Sometimes we go as Jacob. All these things are against us. God says, all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose. Or again, uh, uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 4, our light affliction which is but for a moment worketh for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory while we look not at the things which are seen but the things which are unseen. For the things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are unseen are eternal. He wants us to get God's vantage point, God's perspective on our life and on our situations. Especially when we are under duress, it's hard to think spiritually, logically, logically, 
So I think sometimes our tendency, we have to check our tendencies when we, like these people who went into captivity, and hopefully we'll never undergo such a tremendously long trial. But we have to remember our tendency can be to go one of two different ways. We have to patiently seek the Lord that he would give us light. Thirdly, how do we apply this verse to us? This verse 11, where Jeremiah, speaking the words of the Lord, For I know the thoughts that I think toward you, saith the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you an expected end. Perhaps you've received a greeting card in the mail. Perhaps you've been going through a trial and this verse has been on the greeting card. And there is this, this sweeping generalization as though this verse applies in every situation. Uh, every, every time a card goes out, well, this must apply to that. And we cannot, we cannot arbitrarily we cannot, with, with a sweeping generalization, uh, uh, try to force fit this verse at face value. Um, the intent of, intent of this verse, obviously, in a historical context, and it may or may not apply to every situation or circumstance we find ourselves in, but, but there is some validity in making this application when we look at the whole verse. If we do not isolate it, note the connecting verse of verse 10. He is going to perform his good word towards us. The thoughts of peace, the thoughts of an expected end are tied with verse 10. And there's a sweeping generalization that does apply to our life. He will perform his good word. He will deliver on his promises because... He has spoken that word. He reminds these people that a promise has been spoken. It was given a timetable that he would be able to pronounce a, a blessing of deliverance because it was all according to his word. Again, I think here is an important link, again, between God and his word. God cannot lie. So in verse 11, he has already spoken his good word in verse 10. Let me give you one quote from Matthew Henry. He says this, He will give them not necessarily the expectations of their fears, nor the expectations of their fancies, but the expect, ex, expectations of their faith, the end which he had promised and will turn for the best to them. In other words, what is in view is not necessarily the particular circumstance or affliction or difficulty. What God sees from eternity is their faith, their relationship with him. Again, the larger context, of course, God has an end for us. He has these thoughts of peace as, as born-again children. Um, and not of evil, but even God's people go through difficulties. Even God's people go through chastisement when it's warranted. And modern day theology would like to say, they would like to take this kind of a verse and force fit it and, and give this, this portrayal that, that the Christian is happy, happy, happy all the time, 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 which is not true Christianity. This is the larger context, your faith, the good word God has spoken, the promises of God. These things concern God. And these things concern us, these promises. You, you could think of some of the promises of God. I will never leave thee, nor forsake thee. Jesus prayed that in the garden, he said, I will also that though those you have given me be with me where I am, that they may behold my glory. 
But when, when is that promise going to be realized? Not till eternity, right? Mm -hmm. Nevertheless, it's as good as gold because God said it. Jesus prayed it. All of the promises of God in him, that is in Jesus Christ, are yea, and in him, um, amen, unto the glory of the Father. The promises of God, very similar to this word that Jeremiah spoke to the people. The foundation of the promises and every gospel word, the foundation is that they were given from God. God's word and his promises are linked with his decrees and his acts. God decrees something and then God providentially acts it out, makes it happen. The promises display his immutability, his power, his eternality. In other words, you should be able to see a promise of God and it should reflect to you something about the character and the nature of God. God doesn't give flimsy promises. God doesn't give a shallow word. His word is united with him. The range of his promises from Genesis to Revelation. The larger concern is what God is speaking about here ultimately. Whatever good word God has previously spoken, concerning us, concerning his people, concerning his cause, he will bring it to pass. And again, verse 11 does resemble the nature of God's disposition towards his people. Though under chastisement, he's going to bring thoughts, he has thoughts of peace, and he is working something in and through the people. So fourthly, this afternoon, how do you characterize the thoughts of God towards us? So, so what kind of thoughts does God have toward you? And if you had to give a couple adjectives about those thoughts towards us, um, what would those adjectives be? The very fact that God thinks upon us, I think, is amazing in and of itself. We know in general the thoughts God has towards us. They're, they're caring. They're practical. They're tender. They're compassionate and loving. They are purposeful. They're not willy-nilly arbitrary. They're constant. They're infinitely wise. We could make a list of what God's thoughts are or towards us. I want to give you two thoughts or two, two characteristics of God's thoughts towards us. The first one is they are numerous. They are numerous. God has a lot of thoughts about you. He has, he has a lot. Let me read a well-known couple of verses from Psalm 139, verse 17 and 18. How precious also are thy thoughts unto me, O God! How great is the sum of them! If I should count them, they are more in number than the sand. When I awake, I am still with thee. If you could hold out both hands, and if I could dump in several, uh, fill out those hands with sand, <coughs> that doesn't even begin to count how many thoughts God has towards you. More than the sand of the sea, God's thoughts towards you are numerous. And again, remember, his thoughts towards you all those other attributes of his thoughts towards you are there as well. There's, there's an order to his thoughts. They, they are constant and, and they're not haphazard. All preparatory to the work of Christ in your hearts. His thoughts towards you. They are precisely 
what his thoughts and infinite God's thoughts to you should be. And remember, God is omniscient. He knows all things perfectly and eternally. He is omnipresent. He is everywhere present. In our bad times, in our best times, he is there. God's thoughts are numerous. If you can imagine somebody, perhaps a spouse, a friend, if you could have a very cogent thought towards that person, well-ordered, um, worthwhile, uh, uh, full of emotion like love and, and mm -hmm. compassion, if you could have a thought towards that person, one thought every minute, and that's hard because it takes us a while to, to construct a thought that's, that's orderly and worthwhile and, and full of emotion, let's say, and true. But if you could construct one thought towards your spouse or, or towards a friend, one every minute for 10 hours, that would be 600 thoughts in a day towards that person. That's nothing compared to an infinite God, an eternal God, who has these ongoing thoughts towards his own, towards you. His thoughts towards you are numerable. That's one way we can characterize his thoughts. Secondly, we can also characterize his thoughts as being eternal. Eternal. In other words, they're not memories. They're not memory. They're not something in the past. He's not reminiscing about you right now. Everything looks forward to give you this expected end. They're, they're eternal, and, and though they're eternal, I mean, God's thoughts are so lofty, but his thoughts are personal, even though they're eternal. They're eternal and, and personal at the same time. The psalmist said in Psalm 33, the counsel of the Lord standeth forever, there's eternal, and the thoughts of his heart are towards his generation. There's personal. So that the quality of these thoughts towards you are eternal. His ways are love, though they transcend our feeble range of sight. They wind through darkness to their end in everlasting light. Mm -hmm. Right now, we are, we're winding through this pilgrimage. And we, never, we wonder sometimes, will I make it to the end? And according to his good word, the path of the just, is as the shining light that shineth more and more into the perfect day. He has eternal thoughts towards us. And though they're eternal, and it's hard for us to understand eternal things, they're very deeply personal. They have to be personal because he created you to be exactly who you are. And to be received into the gospel kingdom as who you are. And then as you are to, to conform you to the image of his son, and yet you're not a clone. You're still an individual in his economy. So they're very personal, and because he's an eternal God, they're eternal. Think about that. It's, it's amazing. God's thoughts towards you are more than you can number, and they're from that eternal standpoint. And they're personal. God's thoughts towards you are different than his thoughts towards you are different than your, his thought towards you. This is why he, he, he demands this personal walk with him. We don't hide behind a denomination. We don't hide behind some confession of faith or some outward profession because he's individually working with us. I know the thoughts I have towards you. There's our hope. There, there's a place to put our assurance and our faith. We may not know, but God knows. God knows.
Well, in the last place this afternoon, we said something about the thoughts God has towards us. Let me leave you with a question. What do you think about God? Do you have thoughts about God? His thoughts towards you are innumerable, and the quality of them is very, very high. Sometimes we have shallow thoughts about God. Uh, what kind of thoughts do you have about God when you are in a difficult place? Do you have thoughts about God when you're in a good place, or is that the time that we forget God? Do you understand that thoughts of God place you near him and draw us close to himself? As a man thinketh in his heart, so he is. I think it's a legitimate question to ask a believer today. What thoughts do we have towards God? Are we even thinking about him? Can we have a spiritually cogent, well thought out thought towards him? And as we go along in this pilgrimage, is our mind being, being brought captive unto the obedience of Christ so that, so that we are growing in our thoughts about God because we're growing relative to the Christian experience and relative to our knowledge of him. God knows the thoughts he has towards us. I trust that we have, will not be on the same level as God, of course, but we have good thoughts towards God. Well, let's pray. Father, thank you for your word. Father, though we've just briefly, by way of exhortation, thought about this, this wonderful truth, we rest. We rest in the fact that you have thoughts towards us, and we know they are good thoughts, thoughts of peace and not of evil. And though we struggle, uh, though sometimes we have difficulties, yes, yet you will give us that expected end, that expected end that your scriptures speak about. Father, we thank you for this tremendous word, the Bible that provides on every level comfort and assurance and hope. The very thing that those tribes who were carried away captive needed, you brought that word in season to them, the very word that they needed to hear. Help us, Father, to receive thy word. Help us to understand it and believe it to thy glory and for our good. We ask in Jesus' name, amen.